documentary actually started 20 years ago when I was in graduate film school. It was around the time of the hostage crisis. It seemed to me at the time that the way the news was being covered was changing, and that this was typified by Rupert Murdoch's New York Post. So I went and I interviewed the editor of the New York Post on video, very primitive video. Do you think that uh, you people increase public panic sometimes about shortages? Is it possible? Yeah, I, yes, I, actually, I think that's where, it's, uh, that, that's where the panic starts, uh, through uh, the media coverage, through newspaper coverage, television coverage. Do you think that the New York Post tells the true story? Or? Well, it, sometimes you cannot uh, depend on the media. I think what they create is they create, like, yes, you can create a panic, right? New York is a tough town. can be very abrasive. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I'm not a great believer in adding to anyone's anxieties. Peter Mitchellmore was quite candid with me that day. Later I found out why. Are you leaving? Yes, go on. I incompatible with the uh, newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the boat is fine, it's selling well, but it's not my kind of newspaper anymore. That's it. That day in 1980, we spoke about the hostages and the new phenomenon of a never-ending story. They were finally released the day Reagan was inaugurated. I didn't think anything of this coincidence at the time. Meddled in the situation to make sure that the hostages didn't get released before election day. Gary Sick was a member of the Carter administration and on the staff of the National Security Council from August 1976 to April 1981. According to Mr. Six's congressional testimony, quote, in the course of hundreds of interviews in the U.S., Europe, and the Middle East, I have been told repeatedly that individuals associated with the Reagan-Bush campaign of 1980 met secretly with Iranian officials to delay the release of the American hostages until after the presidential election. For this favor, Iran was rewarded with a substantial supply of arms from Israel, end quote. According to Mr. Sick, low-level intelligence operatives and arms dealers are no Boy Scouts, end quote. Their accounts were not identical, but on the central facts, they were remarkably consistent. Because of my past government experience, I knew about certain events that could not possibly be known to most of the sources. Yet their stories confirm these facts. Again, quoting Gary Sick, from October 15th, to October 20th, 1980. Events came to a head in a series of meetings in Paris. Accounts of these meetings vary. There is, however, widespread agreement on a number of points. One, William Casey, Reagan's campaign manager, was a key participant. Two, Iranian representatives agreed that the hostages would not be released prior to the presidential election on November 4th. Three, in return, Israel would serve as a conduit for arms and spare parts to Iran. Quote, At least five of the sources who said they were in Paris in connection with these meetings insist that George Bush was present for at least one meeting. Three sources say they saw him there. Former President George Bush denied being in Paris. According to Sick, immediately after the Paris meetings, things began to happen. Iran publicly shifted its position in the negotiations with the Carter administration, disclaiming any further interest in receiving military equipment. Again, according to Sick, between October 21st and October 23rd, Israel sent a plane load of F-4 fighter aircraft tires to Iran in contravention of the U.S. boycott and without informing Washington. There was a congressional investigation into this claim eventually it was grossly inadequate. It was a real whitewash. A lot of questions were never even entertained, much less answered. In 1991, a congressional committee led by Democratic Congressman Lee Hamilton declared there to be no credible evidence linking Reagan's team with a delay in the hostages release. In two contemporaneous magazine articles, charges of an October surprise were discounted. According to Mr. Sick, quote, after listening to the evidence, one of the former hostages I spoke with said simply, I don't want to believe it. 
it's too painful to think about. Whatever the truth of the October surprise may be, what is undeniable is that the story is a career graveyard for journalists seeking to work in the corporate mainstream. If you read what uh, the hostages themselves had to say later in their various reminiscences of the experience, and you read some of the press coverage in depth, you, you, you find that the Iranians were guarding the hostages, had their uh, stopwatches out. I mean, they were, they were waiting for a particular moment to let those hostages run into uh, the uh, field of vision of the photographers who were all there ready to take their picture. Do you agree with this statement? Whatever is regularly broadcast is the definition of what is news. Or do you have another definition? Um, that is a good question because, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, it, if it happens but you don't hear about it, did it happen? 